This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. This week, we have Bonnie John from Carnegie Mellon University. And she's a great example of what I think of as one of the three major strands in HCI. So I always talk about there's the technical strand, things we know how to build. There's the social strand of how people interact with each other. And then the psychology. And of course, the field of human-computer interaction started out uh, from the field of psychology and human factors. Bonnie, uh, although she has her master's in mechanical engineering from Stanford, mm -hmm. so she's an old-time uh, friend of ours, but uh, she did her work in cognitive science at Carnegie Mellon, working with Alan Newell, who, again, many of you probably know of from his work in both psychology and artificial intelligence, along with Herbert Simon, really created the field of cognitive science or cognitive psychology um, applied to information processing of the way we know it. And Bonnie is really the most prominent uh, person in that field. I mean, when you have something that involves in it, some kind of experiment that has to look at the cognitive model of what's actually going on in people's minds uh, when they're using a computer, uh, Bonnie has done the research and is the, is the right person to go to for all of that. Along with that, past few years, she's been collaborating with Len Bass, who's in another institute at uh, CMU called the Software Engineering Institute. Uh, looking at the interrelationship between the design of the human interaction and the design of the software architecture. Uh, and that's a branch of work which is underappreciated, as I'm sure she will say, uh, on both sides. That is, you sort of assume you can do the software and you can do the interface and then stick them together, and it doesn't work that way. Uh, and she'll, today she'll be talking about the research uh, that she and Len have done uh, on the relationship between interaction and architecture. I should also say, let me step back one second. Uh, Bonnie is here for a visit as the Tom Wasso visiting, visiting scholar, is that yes. the phrase, uh, in symbolic systems. So if you are interested in hearing more or uh, getting more involved with what she's doing, uh, she's around. She has an office uh, in building 460 040E, basement. Right. Basement 460. Those of you who have been around a while, it's where the computer science was before they built this building. Um, linguistics is now. Linguistics is now. So, and she's, uh, you can contact her through the, inf the information on the uh, seminar website. Okay. I don't have a pocket. Oh, I do. I do. Oops. See this? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Ariel? Okay. Um, so, let me just give you a little, a little more background because it sounds like when, when Terry introduces me, you know, I do all this cognitive modeling stuff. Oh, and then I also do the software architecture stuff. Okay, but there really is a common thread there because um, when I, I was a practicing engineer, I have a professional engineer's license. I worked at Bell Laboratories before the breakup of uh, the Bell system, and I was in the D part, the development part of uh, of R and D there, and I designed data and telecommunication systems. I moved into systems engineering, and I was writing, you know, 500-page specifications for systems. And I said to myself, well, you know, I have no idea whether this is going to be easy for people to use. And so I started taking um, human factors classes at night to try to figure that out. And what I discovered was that my Human factors textbooks were very different than my mechanical engineering textbooks because in mechanical engineering textbooks, you have problems to solve and you have answers in the back of the book because there's ways to actually solve them. Where in the human factors textbooks, there were names and dates and experiments and results and virtually nothing where you could plug in a number and crank through and do some sort of analysis that would predict whether what you were designing now was going to be good enough when you actually got it out into the world. So I 
quit my high paying engineering job to become a slave, otherwise known as a psychology graduate student, um, and did primarily the modeling stuff that, that Terry said because I wanted to build, I wanted to beat psychology into a form that engineers could use it. But there's many different forms that engineers can use things. You can do calculations, which is what I do in my cognitive modeling, um, where you know you set up your model correctly and it cranks through and gives you numbers at the end of how long something might take or how many links people might click on or something like this. So you can get numbers out of a, a calculation. But engineers do other things. Engineers also collect best practice and then design from what has happened before. And the, the point there is, you know, it's happened for the, well, in mechanical engineering, you know, we've had screws and inclined planes and things like that since, you know, before the pyramids. It worked in all those other hundreds and thousands of years, and so it'll probably work next time, right? Um, so that designing from past history and collection of best practice is another very common engineering approach. And so because I'm doing things that are not calculational but are more best practice, um, that's still very consistent with beating psychology into a form engineers can use it. So that's kind of the overarching theme of my life, uh, much of which is cognitive modeling because models are also things engineers do, but also um, what we'll be talking about today. So we're going to talk about software architecture and usability and how they're sort of kind of forgotten on both sides of the, the uh, aisle as it is. So here's the scene. The usability analyses or the user test data are in. The development team is poised to respond to these new data. Okay? The software has been carefully modularized so that it will be easy to modify things in the UI. When the usability problems are presented at the table, the developers scream, oh no, we can't change that. So it's our experience um, that often the requested modification feature or functionality reaches too far into the architecture of the system to allow changes to be done in a timely or economic manner. So even when the functionality is right, even if you assume you've done all your upfront requirements right, even when the UI is carefully separated, there are architectural decisions that can, that can preclude delivering a usable system. And this is a problem that uh, Len Bass and I, and now our graduate student Elsa Golden, have been working on for a few years. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the current state of the relationship between software architecture and usability, our proposals on how to um, improve the current state, and some evidence that our proposals have value. So first, what leads to can't change that? It comes from the interaction between usability design principles and processes and software development principles and processes. So for usability, we've always been talking about iteration is key. Okay? We'll do rapid prototyping with, um, with you know, detailed design on paper. We'll do all sorts of early tests, different types of analyses. We'll go as early as we can. But we're, we expect change because we don't know what people, how people are going to react as much as we'd like to. But for software engineering, architecture is key in some ways because there are early decisions made for many, many different reasons that make later decisions easier or harder to do. Talk about that a little bit. Um, when we do iterative development in HCI, there's usually three types of changes we find. Okay? Sometimes you need to change the functionality. I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, but even if you got the functionality right, there's typically two types of changes. One is what we kind of think of as screen deep user interface. Uh, well, you know, people didn't see this button. We've got to move it into some place where they're actually looking so they'll see the feedback we give them. Or, or even uh, I have lots of things where they flash up the dialog box so fast you can't read it. Well, let's slow that down. Okay? So these sorts of things are, are kind of screen deep. And then there's other things that require mo changes beyond just what is presented. And we're going to explore a little bit what those sorts of things are. Now the other part is what is software architecture? There are a lot of definitions of software architecture. Um, I have one colleague back at Carnegie Mellon who his definition of software architecture is that which is most difficult to change. <laughs> okay. um, for now, the important part is the key difference is that 
software architecture does make some things easy to change and other things harder to change. So you get, we can't change that because of this. You, you know, software architecture makes some things easy to change. Iterative design discovers things that have to be changed. And this is stuff that we can't change that because we didn't anticipate it in the architecture design and now we're supposed to change it somehow. But, you know, why can't we just go do it? Well, because there, you know, usability is one of the, what they call quality factors or quality attributes software engineers talk about. Um, but it's only one. I mean, they've got a lot of things to worry about. Performance, availability, maintainability, security, et cetera, et cetera. They list, they call them the illities, okay? And there's lots of them. Not, they don't end in illity, but like security. All right, but they're, there's a, you know, maybe 15 or so in like the ISO standards, okay? And costs, benefits, and schedule tend to determine what actually gets done, okay? The problem for software engineers or for a development team is that we don't necessarily know what the impact of having a usability issue come up on the software architecture. So it's hard to estimate the cost, the benefit, and the uh, schedule. So we're trying to attack some of that. So like I said, there's a lot of different um, definitions of architecture in the literature. I just want to say what we're talking about when we say this. Um, this is a high level structural design of the software that enumerates all the major modules, enumerates the responsibilities of those modules, and tells the interaction between those. So control and data flow, sequence information, um, allocation, these sorts of things. And software architecture is, most software engineers will tell you, the first artifact that actually could be analyzed to see whether it satisfies or at least doesn't preclude achieving some of the quality attributes that you'd like to achieve. Okay. So you can look at an architecture and do an analysis on its performance, for instance, and say, you know, there's no way the signal's going to be able to do all this and get back in the amount of time we think it has to do it. Okay. Um, so how do you represent them? Again, there's a million different kinds. Here's a book that Len was uh, one of the authors on. You can see I think there's eight authors. You can imagine the nightmare of getting this book out, but there's like probably twice that number of ways to represent uh, software architecture. For, for now, we'll use UML-like diagrams. And I say like because uh, standard UML doesn't have any way to represent the user, for instance. OK, so, um, so we've modified it a little bit. Um, well, a lot of people, I mean, there's, there's arguments as why you should even care about software architecture. Our argument is, if you don't choose one, you're going to have one anyway. <laughs> so you better design it for the things that you believe are important as early as you can possibly um, figure those out. And when you have a good software architecture, it can reduce the development time um, and maintenance costs. It helps you do with reuse of, of, of design. It helps understand what you're doing. It's not spaghetti code if you've got a good design. Um, and these are the sorts of things that software um, architects will tell you why you should hire them and keep them around. Okay. But how does that relate to usability? So let's look at a very prototypical software life cycle. So these are kind of activities. Some sort of system formulation. You know, what are we going to do at all? Some sort of requirements generation and recording somehow. Typically some sort of architecture design at that point. And then a lot of detailed design, both of code, interface, the way it's going to look, the way it's going to work, all this sort of stuff, okay? Actually implementing it and then deploying it, testing it, testing it, and deploying it. If we look at the well-known HCI techniques, we can see that we've got a gap, okay? We've got ways to go out to our users and elicit what we should build, okay? interviewing questionnaires, contextual inquiry, ethnography, you know, all sorts of things. We can try to figure out what we should build. We have a lot of techniques that help with detailed design. Heuristic evaluation, cognitive walkthrough, a whole bunch of things that can help critique at a paper prototype level or, or more. Um, rapid prototyping, user testing, you know, they can critique the detailed design. We have UI toolkits that help with the implementation. 
we have things, uh, log analysis and things we can do when it's out in the field and we're getting data. But there's really nothing that speaks to how can the usability concerns impact the architecture design. Well, so what? Okay. The so what is that decisions get made there that have impact on the rest of it. So if we are not at the table, we HCI people are not at the table with methods and uh, data and analyses, at that time, that could be a really big so what. So a lot of times when I show that slide, people say, well, that looks like waterfall and I don't use waterfall. OK, so my company is safe. Well, um, the problem is that actually all development uh, cycles map into something that's relatively similar. There are always earlier decisions that impact later ones. OK, so I, can, I have some pictures. OK, so this is the original waterfall, and architecture shows up there. This is the spiral model, and architecture shows up here. But it's not, it's, you know, if you're finding things that unit tests or acceptance tests to get back there, it's harder. OK, here's the RUP um, cycle, rational unified process. Architecture shows up there. And I know these overlap, but still, there's earlier decisions that impact later ones. Um, this one is an HCI one by Mayhu. If you read this carefully, this is where the architecture is. And notice, there's no lines back. None of these have lines back to the architecture design. Um, here's a, a, a representation of extreme programming. Uh, there's an architectural spike here. Okay, And notice, there's no lines back. Okay, So when the people who know about these things draw these representations, I understand, I understand. I'm not saying that I know refactoring is supposed to do all this sort of stuff, okay? But there's, there are people who study this stuff in practice, and they're worried that there's no lines back. And we can argue about that later, offline. So I just want you to, 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 to not take for granted that you don't have this problem because you've adapted a certain um, software development style. OK. So what are we going to talk about today? Some way to bring usability concerns to the table when you're doing architecture design. OK. Well, software engineers have analysis and design techniques for many quality um, uh, attributes. They have analytic models to help them with performance or reliability and, and some others. Um, and they also, as I said, an, a common engineering thing is to have best practices somehow um, codified so that they can use. And uh, the recent, relatively recent thing is to have lots of patterns, okay, for, uh, the pattern literature. There's architectural patterns that exist for various different, that optimize for different, or maybe not optimize is the wrong word in a computer science lecture, um, that do better for certain quality attributes than others. Um, and so we're focusing on that part, on finding, um, architectural patterns that will help achieve usability, because we don't actually have the turn the crank analysis yet. OK, so let me just uh, say the difference between an architectural pattern versus a software architecture. Patterns give very limited information. They're independent of any particular application. They're a general solution, almost a notional solution for something. Very much is left unspecified, because it's not talking about a particular thing. But it gives you sufficient guidance for a design approach that you can then apply this pattern to your particular problem. Software architecture, on the other hand, a particular system is when you flesh out that pattern and you enumerate all these major modules and all those sorts of things within the patterns that you particularly pick. So here's a pattern uh, that's used for um, uh, things that are interactive, UI design, called model view controller. And there's a whole history of model view controllers, and the words get munged around. Um, you can find most of the history of this Wikipedia. Um, and it's evolved from originally small talk back in the 80s to something that works pretty well for the modern web environment. And it pretty much looks like this in those UML type diagrams. Okay. Um, so what does that mean? Right, it means that we've got some responsibilities of the model, which is that guy, 
um, that holds on to your application state and provides the functionality of the system, a view that renders the models or the state um, and sends user gestures um, and interactions to the controller, and the controller transforms these interactions from the view into actions to be performed by the model, and it also selects views if there's many different views on the same uh, information that's in the models. Um, some of the more modern stuff, some things actually happens all in the view. So when you're moving your mouse and the cursor is tracking that and the thing that you're dragging is tracking that, that's all happening in the view. And that was a performance consideration. Older models actually made it go all the way down to the model and come back. It was too slow. So that was the sort of thing that, um, uh, that architecture can do for you. If you got the wrong one, you get really slow response time. If you've got one tuned for interaction, you can have things that work well in human time. Um, so this is... Uh, a pattern that we'll use as we go along, kind of as a baseline, as a general pattern uh, to illustrate <clears throat> what our usability issues are. So how does, um, you know, some of the characteristics of MVC, okay, it hides the screen deep user inter interaction stuff from the remainder of the application. It's all your functionality is down in the model, okay. It uses an intermediary, that controller, to buffer changes in the user interface from um, the remainder of the application, that gives certain characteristics. It localizes screen deep changes to either changing just the view or sometimes the controller and the, and the view, um, and you don't have to touch your application. And so that has a lot of really good characteristics for, um, for UI design. Um, we'll use that as the, the lecture um, or the example in the rest of this lecture. Though there are others and the points that we're making apply across others as well. So how does MVC support iterative design? That thing that we HCI people do all the time. So for example, if you, um, oh, we had, a, we had an interesting problem the other day. I noticed uh, I was talking with a student who was showing me your Blackboard um, system for giving class notes and things. Well, CMU also uses Blackboard. And we brought ours up next to each other to see what they had, uh, what they had changed. And it was interesting because Stanford, you know, Stanford always says Stanford in red, and it's typically on a white background. Well, CMU also uses red, but it had a, 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 a Carnegie Mellon in red with a gray background. It turns out that the Blackboard system has a whole bunch of text and links in white that you could see in the Carnegie Mellon one, and you can't see in the Stanford one. But if you roll over it, they're there. OK, now this is a problem that user testing way late. You know, here we are sitting in class trying to get something on Blackboard. And we've now discovered this. We could send that back to people. That would be easy to change. They have architected that system that you can change that background. And guess what? You'll be able to see the text. <laughs> OK, so that one only requires a small change that's localized to one part of this architecture. Um, if you want to change things like the order of a dialogue in a wizard, for instance, that typically means changes to the controller. Okay, you've already got what it's going to look like, but you're going to change the order, and that can um, can change things only in the controller. So these things are good. When you're trying to change something that's localized to one module, that makes the changes a lot easier to do. So when the user test data comes in, says we have to change these sorts of things, your system has already been architected, so those are easy. That's great. But what happens when you have usability issues that reach all over the place. So let's think about the ability to cancel commands, long running commands. This requires modification of all three modules. The view has to actually present something to allow people to cancel it, like a cancel button. Okay? And it has to provide uh, sorts of feedback about what's being canceled and how long it's going to take to cancel and all that sort of stuff. The controller has to listen for that cancel command and pass that information on. The model has to do a heck of a lot. It has to actually listen for the command to, to um, uh, to terminate, it has to know how to terminate, it has to know how to roll back, it has to provide information about how long it's going to take to do this. It's got a tremendous amount of stuff to do. If you didn't add this in early and your user test data comes back and says, hey, we forgot to do cancel, it may be intractable in your deadlines to get this out the door to add this later. So. This is the kind of example of a well-known usability issue 
that we don't have to think about this. We don't have to get user data to say, long-running commands probably should be able to cancel. So we can actually have those sorts of requirements at the architecture design table early, as early as, um, as anything else. So this, we have to consider this in our architecture design. So let's talk about, so, so basically, these sorts of things don't get talked about. When I talk to software engineers, five years ago, they didn't even list usability as a quality attribute. Now, at least I'm seeing in software engineering talks that being listed as one of the quality attributes. That's a great step forward. But if they weren't even thinking about it as a quality attribute, they weren't talking about it when they were designing architectures. Okay? And they still aren't very much. Um, and on the other side, the HCI people often don't even know what architecture is. And so they don't know that they're not at the right meetings. And they wouldn't know what to say if they got there. And so we're trying to bring these two folks together, and I'll show you how now. So our goal is to achieve better usability of software systems by making more informed early software decisions. We are trying to determine uh, at least some subset or you know, some reasonable set of usability requirements that impact, that are impacted by the software architecture and would impact software architecture decisions. We're trying to operationally, operationalize the relationship between these usability concerns and software architecture design and incorporate all this knowledge in something that software engineers can use. Okay. So we're trying to make this relationship of software architects and usability people more proactive rather than wait till the test data are in and come back and complain. Well, isn't this a solved problem? We actually get this a lot from reviews, OK? Um, well, it turns out that you know, human-computer interaction books and, uh, and, and usability data say what to include pretty broadly, but rarely how to do that. Okay? So for canceling commands, you know, Nielsen's usability heuristics you know, are calling for command in the user control and freedom. Um, but it doesn't say, what does the software have to do? So what we're doing is assuming on the HCI side that if you simply point out the problem, the software engineers will know how to implement it. That's kind of an assumption in most of many usability um, development teams. Well, apparently this isn't a solved problem. I just kept a log of the things that can't cancel. Uh, for it was about like a two-month period or something. And these like across a lot of manufacturers, okay, so my Adobe Acrobat didn't do it, my Corporate Time Now Oracle couldn't do it, my Eudora couldn't do it, iMovie couldn't do it, Help Viewer didn't do it, OmniGraph will do it. I mean, it was like, I was running across this. This is something that usability has known forever. People have to be able to cancel. And yet all these commercial products couldn't do it in a way that actually satisfied me as a user. Okay, so it's apparently not a solved problem. So <clears throat> our strategy is to take those aspects of usability that are architecturally significant, and I'm going to define that in a minute, provide and embody them in little scenarios, provide a checklist of important software responsibilities that have to be um, uh, implemented or considered in the architecture design and implementation, provide reasoning about the user benefits because then you can have some idea of what will it take to actually implement this and some idea of how it might benefit the users and have that discussion when you're doing your cost benefit, you know, how are we going to allocate our resources and we've got all these things we have to do. There's always, you know, we have to make the performance 10% better, we have to increase our security, we have to do that, and we have to do these usability things. How do you decide which are important? So you need that cost benefit discussion. Um, and uh, use them in regular software engineering uh, design and evaluation methods. So what does software uh, architecturally significant mean? It means that this scenario is not well supported by separation of the UI from the functionality alone. Okay? So it may be that the typical or that a solution to this has to go to many, many modules, or that to make it easy to change, the software would have to combine information in one module, which it wouldn't necessarily do if you didn't think about it ahead of time. Um, and so the examples that I gave before, changing the color of text is not architecturally significant 
changing the order of dialogues is not architecturally significant, but adding the cancel command is. So we have um, come up with these little scenarios. Each one is a very short little description, like cancellation, the user issues a command, the change at uh, war changes his or her mind, wants to stop the operation and return the software to the uh, previous state. It doesn't matter why, I don't care, okay? But we have to be able to stop it. We have about two, do we have identified about two dozen such scenarios that reach beyond that separation of UI from functionality. And we can talk about all of them at some point, but not now. So we have embodied these in what we call a usability supporting architectural pattern, or a set of them, okay? And it has three parts. The first and smallest is the scenario itself, and that is an example of the canceling command scenario that I just read to you, okay? But you can't just give people the scenario. This is very similar to what usability folks do right now. They say, you have to be able to cancel, you have to be able to group things and operate all, you know, turn them all blue at once. You have to be able to do these sorts of things. Um, and there, they have the potential for being a requirement. But we need to be able to first argue about the benefit and we need to be able to understand what it will mean in terms of implementation costs to be able to do, have an intelligent cost-benefit talk when they're um, allocating resources. So um, we're adding more things. We add um, a discussion of benefits to the user, potential benefits to the user that you might realize in your system if you were to implement this. And it's not just cancel. I mean, we have these 24, okay? Um, and then we have a lot more about what is important to the implementation. So we list general responsibilities that we have developed from understanding what the user wants, how the software works, and what things happen in the environment. Okay, so for instance, cancel is not just at the user's discretion. The software in your car has to cancel the window going up if the dog's head is in the window. Okay, and that's a software issue. Len Bass has done, uh, works with um, some automotive companies actually, and that was one of their software issues. Okay, so that's the environment issuing the cancel command. Okay, not just a button doing things. Okay, so there's, there's forces all over the place. Typically, these lists of responsibilities are somewhere between 10 or 20 um, detailed responsibilities of the software that have to be assigned to modules and considered. Um, and the software development team doesn't blindly say, we have to do everything here. But what they need to do is discuss each one and say, is this applicable at this point? Do we have to think about this? Okay, and they can have an intelligent conversation if they can have some help thinking about things. So th this is just a, a, we have 21 responsibilities for cancel. Um, I'm not going to go through them, but, you know, it's a list, a bunch of things expressed in terms that software engineers understand. Then we also give a sample solution that allocates all these responsibilities to different modules. Okay, and they're expressed typically in UML-like diagrams. So here's the original MVC pattern. This is what you have to consider doing if you want to do cancel to a, uh, a good level of support for that. Now, how do we get these responsibilities? Well, Len is a, uh, an expert in software architecture. He's written many books on the subject, and he knows a lot. Okay, remember that best practice thing? Okay, so he generates some, I yell at him, but you know, what about this? User, user wants to be able to do this, how do you support that? User wants to do this, how do you support that? We came together with a, um, a, a proposal for this, and then we vetted it with a panel of eight software um, architecture experts from both industry and academia. Okay, so this is a, an amalgamation of um, a lot of expertise, and that's what a pattern is. Okay, now it would be nice to go out and say, what, how do actual systems implement this but we find so many systems that don't implement it fully that I'm not sure we can find it in the world. I know the patterns community wants at least three examples of actual running code. Um, we, haven't, we haven't found that yet, but anyway. Um, you then take those diagrams and those responsibilities and assign each 
of those responsibilities to some component. I did slides on that, but I'm not going to do it. I just want to show you, you know, we've assigned things to the listener, cancellation manager, the prior state manager, the view. So the old things have new responsibilities, and then the new things have responsibilities as well. We also give people sequence diagrams to say, this is the normal operation. This is the operation if you've got cancel. Okay, so we're giving a lot of information to the designers, software and uh, architecture designers. So that's our proposal. Make usability supporting architectural patterns, provide them to design teams. They can use the arguments about benefits and the information about implementation to have reasonable discussions, decide where to put their effort, and hopefully design software architectures that don't preclude doing uh, good known usability issues at the end. Well, let's look at some evidence as to whether our proposal have value. You always want to know, do these things work? Okay? Well, what does work mean All right, for this? Do USAPs change the architecture design? You know, if you give somebody, you ask them to do the architecture design, they don't have USAPs, you ask them to do it with USAPs, does it change? Okay? Can software developers use them? Because if it's only me and Len who can use them, that doesn't help very much. Okay, we can't go all over the world. All right, we wouldn't want to. So that's another issue of work. Okay, um, if they're used, are there actually fewer usability changes that impact? Usually, the model is the one that's that's upset if you uh, impact it. Um, or if they're used, they're eventually, you know, are the people who use the system that's designed with this happier with it and more productive? Okay, so there's many definitions of work, all right, uh, the, that USAP's work. Um, we haven't gotten to all of these, um, but also when you want to say, okay, does it work, you have to convince people. Well, who do you have to convince? You have to convince software developers, otherwise they won't want to use it, okay? You have to convince their managers to tell them, please use this, or I'll send you to a course to learn how to use this, or something, okay? You have to convince other researchers because we're academics, okay? And you have to convince funding agents because you can't sit down and write all these things without somebody paying your salary. Um, at least I'm not rich enough to do that. Anyway, um, so there's lots of different uh, uh, places people we might want to convince. How would you do that? A lot of times in, so in software engineering, you ask your friends, okay? Um, ask experts. Well, we did that when, when we vetted our responsibilities um, on some of them. Um, we, uh, you could do controlled experiments, you could do usability tests, you could put it out on the world, in the world and see if people like it, um, or you could do formal case studies. I'm going to report now on a controlled experiment that we did and a more formal case study. So we did do controlled experiments, um, and the problem we gave people was please add cancel to an existing architecture design. We gave them all the UML of the existing design, all the component diagrams, the responsibilities, the sequence models, I mean the sequence diagrams, all that sort of stuff of a one that they could understand in like an hour, okay? Um, and we gave one third of the subjects uh, the scenario only, which is similar to just asking them, please add cancel, okay? We gave one third of them the scenario plus the list of general responsibilities, and we gave one third of them the, um, the whole thing that had the, the scenario, the list of responsibilities, and the sample solution in a different pattern. So the thing we were asking them to do was single threaded, it wasn't MVC, it was totally different, and they had to apply the MVC pattern that I just showed you with cancel to that. Um, so our results uh, look like this, if you do statistics, okay, and uh, so scenario only, scenario plus responsibilities, scenario plus responsibilities plus sample solution. What does it mean? The significant differences are that these were not were bad, worse than the other two, okay? But these two, at this point, were not are not uh, statistically different. What's the y-axis on? Responsibilities considered. Um, so we did actually did it two ways. We have a coverage metric that we looked at every diagram. They had to modify these diagrams. We looked at every diagram that they produced, um, all the responsibilities that they wrote down, and we did a debrief, and we did a union of anything that was a clue that they had considered a responsibility, that they even thought about it, that it crossed their mind, and we gave them a point for considering a responsibility. And that's a coverage metric. 
we don't know if that makes a good design, right? So we did another round where we took those and totally anonymized them, took Elsa forever to anonymize these things, and sent them out to that panel of experts and asked them to grade them and say, okay, we had a canonical solution. This is a really good solution. And they got to grade these, these um, against that canonical solution. And they even had the ability to say, this one's better than what we had thought. Okay? Um, and so we, did, we correlated the coverage metric with the quality metric, and it was so close. I mean, it really very highly correlated, which is good news, because that means that we can do other experiments just with the coverage metric, um, because you can't get those experts to do all this grading forever. <laughs> you know? um, so, uh, so that's what that, meant, what that is. Okay. Um, so what does this mean? Um, <clears throat> so when told to design to a usability scenario, which is very similar to what HCI people do. We just give a list of requirements to the software engineers. The participants considered, on average, only three of the 19 responsibilities that we believe they should have considered. Those only three like crossed their minds. They didn't even think of the others. If they had a full use app, this actually helped them do three times as many. So on average, nine instead of three. Simply providing them a list of the responsibilities helped them do this. Um, not this is always different, but you know it's still a little different. And actually, that's that's actually good news. It means you don't have to draw all those UML diagrams. Um, but the surprise here is not that people did better when we gave them more information, because typically you people help, they do better. The surprise is that they did so poorly without it. The people we were looking at had at least a master's in software engineering and several years of industry experience. These were not, not you know, like, you know, sophomore programmers. Okay, these were people who you expect to be able to go implement in the field the things that we asked them to implement. And they weren't even thinking about the things that are important. Excellent question. And uh, so it does mean we have still more research to do, okay, to, uh, to find out why we're not getting them up to great. Okay. We have um, videos of what they were doing. We're trained on what they're doing. So we know what they were looking at and, and this sort of thing. Um, and Elsa is in the midst of analyzing those videos now. So we don't know the answer yet, uh, but she's got a little progress bar on her board. She was up to 77% when I talked to her last week. Okay. Uh, so we'll know in a, in a while. It takes a long time to analyze this video data and make sense of them. So we're hoping that that gives us a window into it. But um, we'd also like to do some Think Loud usability tests, which these were not, you know, to try to understand what, how people were using them. Um, but here's a really great slide. I love this graph. So we've looked at time on task. And this is the line I want you to see. Okay. So uniformly, in all of human behavior, almost, if you spend more time, you, you, you do better on something. And that's what these two lines say. When you have the general responsibilities, when you have general responsibilities plus the sample solution, the more time you spend on it, the more responsibilities you consider, and the better you, your architecture turns out. These are the people who had only the scenario. This is amazing to see in any human data that you know, they didn't get better. Okay, what does it mean? It means that no matter how much time the participants took, they could not do an adequate job of addressing all these things. They didn't give up. It's not that they gave up. They said, oh, I don't know how to do this, and stopped after half an hour. They didn't give up. They kept looking at it, expecting they could figure out what to do. But they couldn't. The surprise here is that it didn't, it didn't help. You know, um, what it means is that all their prior training, all their experience, simply does not provide the necessary information to do well on this task. Now, software engineers need this information that the field has yet to provide for them. So that was our controlled experiment. And then we did some, uh, some work in the lab, um, out in the field as well. We worked uh, with the High Dependability Computing Program with the MER board at NASA. That's the Mars Exploration Rover uh, Project. It was on 
the Mars mission that's currently, it's still going, okay? And it was a collaborative workspace to aid engineers and scientists analyze data and plan their work. So it's a smart board based technology that's helping them see what's coming down from Mars and decide where the rover should go the next day. Um, so <coughs> they, the developers of this uh, had a timeline kind of like this. They started, they started out with ethnography to figure out what to build. Um, then they started developing a prototype. They had a field test of the prototype. The engineers and scientists liked it, and that's when at NASA you get com uh, you're committed to the mission. You actually get the resources to do something after you've done this field test. And they had a little time to breathe to redesign the architecture. Okay, and so this is where um, we came in. They had started to redesign their architecture, but we came in and helped them bring usability to their um, architecture. They had some stated goals for their architecture redesign. He said the initial design, that prototype, the priority was just to get something working. All right? And it had made a monolithic system that was spaghetti code. Okay? The initial design did work. They got excellent response. They were now committed. But they knew that in future use, they needed to be able to extend this to more functionality, to more things that could be displayed on the MER board. They had to get its response time up. The performance was crappy in the, um, in the, the, the monolithic system, the demo. And it had to run all the time and not crash. So reliability was really important. So they had, they had, you know, they had slides that say, OK, these are our values. These are our quality attributes we're maximizing for. And here's our proposed redesign. But they had always said that usability was a high value because this was a, an extra piece of equipment. And those scientists are busy. So they had a bumper sticker that said, Palm Pilot Simple. Okay, that's what they wanted the MER board to be. No more than five minutes training time. Okay, so these were, were things that were always running through. I mean, they were you know, up on the walls. You know, these were their mantras. And yet, when they outlined what is important in our architecture design, usability was not present. So we came in and said, well, let's look at your architecture from the usability point of view. So we tried to, to help them do that, just to see if our methods would be applicable. Um, so we had a meeting with the entire team where they presented their architecture and we presented our approach. Um, the front end developer <coughs> read over our materials. We had a couple of teleconferences with him um, about that and uh, he did a, a redesign of the architecture. Okay. Um, <coughs> what we found is at the time we had 27 USAPs and the design and development team agreed that 25 of them were applicable to the project. So it wasn't that we were sitting back in our ivory tower imagining things that nobody cared about or you know, didn't have anything to do with. They said that they absolutely needed 17 of them by the next field trial. They absolutely needed it. And eight they wanted by 2010. Okay, so, um, so the majority of the things that we had considered earlier, they said, yes, we absolutely need them. Um, and we found in the, the discussions that we recorded, um, the development team is very easy for both sides to articulate, to talk about these USAPs. So the people who did, did ethnography and uh, the usability experts, they say, oh yeah, I saw the need for that in my data. Okay? And the software architects, the software engineers could say, oh, I know how that applies to what I'm designing. So these discussions were centered around these little scenarios, but everyone was in the same room talking about the same thing, and they, under, they seemed to understand each other and their different concerns very well. The team liked it. Okay. Uh, here's the, um, the, the first proposed architecture redesign um, that uh, was, and it's all redacted, it's got all different names and stuff like that. Before we applied the USAPs to it, uh, these changes were made after applying the USAPs to it, um, and I forgot the purple ones are modified component, and the green ones were things that they had forgotten to do, uh, so added components. Um, and, and then they went off and built that. Okay. Um, but the summary is that the USAPs were real, well received by the team. They really could understand how these things fit into their system, or they knew when they didn't. There was not any ambiguity there, like, oh, I don't know, I don't understand this thing, okay. Um, 
The USAPs did have an impact on the architecture design that went forward and was implemented. Okay? And the process fit comfortably into their work pro pro practice. They already had an architecture review meeting scheduled with the design team, with the whole design team, and this was a little longer. Okay, so it, it fit comfortably for them. Um, we have a nice quote from the developer who did most of this. It says, it's nice to keep a list of USAPs next to me, so when I'm making a design decision, I won't forget anything. Uh, we all know the value of checklists. Okay, and so this was uh, something that he thought was very valuable for him. Okay. So we've, um, I've told you what I believe the current state of the relationship between software architecture and usability is, which pretty much, uh, well, software ricature um, is forgotten by HCI uh, methods. We don't have much to say there. And I say forgotten not because necessarily we knew it and just forget. It's like we just don't do much, OK? Um, and software architectures ar architects forget to design for usability, very evident in this MER team, OK? They listed usability as an important goal, but then when they presented their slides of what they're going to do with their architecture, it's not there. So they sometimes literally forget that. But it's not only just forget. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to bring it to the, the design table. Um, and our proposal is to create USAPs that can then be brought to the software architecture design table like other patterns are for performance or availability and these sorts of things. And we believe that we've given some evidence that USAPs actually work both in the lab and in the field. Questions? I'd like to thank all the people I work with and especially the Symbolic Systems uh, program for having me here. Yes, ma'am. Do you uh, have a quick and easy list, or can you put up what uh, some of those responsibilities are? Uh, well, I had, uh, yeah, I had a few of them up. Um, so we, we certainly have a uh, techni technical report from the SEI, 120-page technical report. Um, we've published these lists other places. You can get them off my website. Um, Comments about what sorts of things they are, or there there are three broad categories of these responsibilities, uh, or any sort of comments about what went in there. Yeah. They, these these particular ones were um, focused on single user at a desktop. One of the things we were happy to see when we did the MER board, which is collaborative against the wall, is that so many of them actually applied. Okay, so we didn't design it for that type of system. Um, we've also done, um, so, so we don't know actually if they, if there may, it was probably more. more for collaborative systems, for uh, ubiquitous systems, for mobile systems, you know, so it's probably, so these primarily are single user to desktop. Um, we did find that they, they line up quite well with a lot of known usability heuristics. So there's not a lot of groundbreaking usability in here. Neither is there groundbreaking software architecture in here. But the confluence of them is something that we believe the world needs. Okay? Um, but we did find a couple of usability heuristics that typically don't get found in HCI. And they have to do with um, uh, problems with the system, so system failure. Or this, the, this dog head in the window, you often don't think about that. or Typical HCI people don't think about that as a usability thing necessarily. Um, and so, um, so we have a few that came up by thinking from the software side that don't end up in the textbooks of, of usability things to do. Um, but the, the sort of things you know, are very well known. I mean, information reuse, either manually cut and paste or propagation, okay? um, progress feedback. I mean, these are things that usability people really know, and if they knew to say them early enough, and if they knew to say them with what the implications were, we would have better systems. It was kind of like bring the bottom up, at least. Okay? Um, things, some things about how to support international use uh, a little easier. Um, 
being able to switch back and forth between, uh, between systems, um, supporting visualization, making things work uh, consistently across different views, things like that. There's, um, like I said, there's about two dozen. I have to say about because every once in a while we'll look at two and say, oh, those really are pretty much the same. Should we combine them or not? And so different versions of it have different ones. Um, I have another question. I mean, if you think about uh, uh, usability-oriented design and architectures, you also could think of very different issues. For instance, uh, dealing with uh, differentiation and dynamics in, um, in use context. And then uh, you would like to look at architectures which are flexible in the sense of uh, satisfying more than just uh, one field of application. More one field of application at different points in time, now and maybe how it emerged in the future. Does your work, um, to some extent, give hints uh, how to deal with these problems? So you're talking about changing functionality over time? Is that the sort of thing you're talking about? I don't think we, I, don't, I just don't think we have thought of that. So what we'd really like to have happen um, is for this to be a, a community-based uh, repository of information and have other folks um, both suggest candidate usability problems that might affect um, uh, art, software architecture. The problem, a problem is it takes a long time to make a use app to actually get all these responsibilities and how they could work out and sample patterns and stuff. Um, so we, we actually only have about half a dozen, maybe not even half a dozen, fully worked out. Um, so we have more that have to be done as well, just to get the kind of baseline functionality or baseline usability stuff that we all know. Um, but we, that would be another domain to, to, to work into, uh, to go into, like collaboration would be another domain where I'm sure there'll be more patterns, or <coughs> excuse me, more USAP needs. Um, and we haven't gotten to that one yet. So. Yep. I'm just curious, how do you see this fitting into the larger picture of work on software patterns, mm -hmm. interaction patterns? Yeah. Um, so it, it's very much in there. Okay. So uh, I have um, I have been workshopped by Dick Gabriel. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, we we are searching for a representation that works. Okay. And there's very few studies of whether of different representations of patterns and how people can use them. What is the usability of a pattern? Um, so we have gone into uh, the, the software patterns um, literature and, and worked with the people who work with that to see if we can fit into that formulation. We've done our, our own with these list of responsibilities and things. Um, we're, we're not religious about it, okay? Um, we're looking for, you know, how can we write the handbook that anybody can pick up and use? A lot of the patterns, the typical patterns work, um, is looking also, I mean, a very, very important part of it. How do you get somebody to remember it when it's appropriate? And so a very readable pattern is a, another thing that, uh, that is of value when you're, when you're doing that. And so there's lots of definitions of you know, what works. Um, so we are, we are plugged into that. And when we get a little further along, Dick said, gee, I'll champion you to come to a, a pattern languages um, a workshop thing. And um, uh, unfortunately, before we could go very far on that, we lost our funding for it. Um, though that was a path we were going down, and he was very interested in uh, in helping us break into that particular community, um, and it's very much like the Bushman architecture patterns, that Bushman book, it, it already. Yep. Have you applied some uh, uh, return of investment method in a process using a task like that to to include the the interaction patterns? to know exactly the added value to the final product in terms of usability? Um, <laughs> so we, uh, with this Marboard study, um, we went all the way to the end to get some data on what, um, what people actually used it at the end. And we did do some tracking on, <clears throat> we tried to do some tracking on, you know, here was a, a pattern that was used and it changed the architecture and it actually made it all the way through to the implementation with the original architecture design and then it was used by people in the Mars mission and this is what they happened. They did. They did. Um, 
We've tried to do that. Some of the problem with that is um, there's kind of a leaky pipeline. Like you lose data along the way. Like they, <clears throat> and for things that, you know, totally not under your control. When the original ethnographers worked at the, uh, at the, the NASA, with the NASA engineers to see what should we build, they had, they literally saw people put something on their laptop and then hold the laptop up to the room to say, see, here's my analysis. Okay, and that didn't work very well. Okay, um, so that's one of the reasons they were doing this wall size thing. In between the time their ethnographers saw that and the time that the Mars rovers actually landed on Mars, the environment changed. And every person had at least two or three high definition displays in front of them. And so now, little groups of people were, were looking over somebody's shoulder because they could actually see what they were doing. And so the group dynamic changed, and they ended up with only about 2% time usage on the MER board. Now, so, so there was not as much usage as we expected. And therefore, we had less data. All right? And then the log files sometimes were saved and sometimes weren't. And then sometimes you could figure out what they did or not. And then when you looked at like undo, it, would tell, it wouldn't tell you what it was undoing. So the log files were incomplete. Okay. So it's really, really difficult to track all the way from an architectural decision all the way to usability. We have tried it. My best thing is they actually decided not to implement cancel because it was going to take too many changes and too hard to do. And every time I see Jay Trimble, who is the head of that Murboard project, he says, you told me so. I should have listened to you about cancel. <laughs> so that's my one data point. That, uh, yeah. um, so we, we have not, to our satisfaction, been able to do that. And we've tried for years. We finally had to give up on those log data. Yeah. Have you seen any differences between ESOPs applied to web applications versus desktop applications? We actually have not done, and we haven't had any uh, experience doing on web, web applications. We've done it on about four or five um, desktop, desktop applications, and um, actually, Len has used it for the car manufacturers as well, and they seem applicable there, uh, but we haven't. We just haven't had that. Um, experience, so I can't answer your question. So the, the one that I was thinking of throughout your whole talk is actually a web app one <laughs> that falls very much into this genre is the, the Stanford uh, Computer Science Graduate Admissions web app. Yes. Has, Terry's laughing because anytime anybody joins that committee, they send an email to the support about an hour later <laughs> that says, I'm, my, I'm entering uh, numeric scores and notes and halfway through, I realized it was for the wrong person. I think there's a bug in the system. It turns out that it just doesn't work with tab browsing, oh, which yes, is okay. what everybody instantly does. You open up about 15 tabs, and then one for each person, one right? For, right. Yeah. It doesn't work with that. It, 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 you got to keep no more than one tab. It's uh, uh, and of course, and it doesn't tell you that, right? It doesn't tell you that, and it's, uh, and then you get a nasty gram back from the developers that says, "Well, what are you doing opening more than one tab?" Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and this is a classic, uh, you know, architecture thing, and so I just want mm -hmm. to sort of offer that one as a web example that falls into the same Great. set of issues. Do you have anybody who can do the responsibilities and, and diagrams for me? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Well, so the, I mean, the, the, but the question that I, so the question that I had is that I thought it was really interesting that you had the. If you gave people the set of responsibilities, mm -hmm. it was the same as giving, almost the same as also giving them the UML, which, which intuitively makes sense. Um, well, yes, it, it, what is intuitive? OK, the patterns community says you can't just give the description. You have to have three examples. OK, that's a rule. It's not a pattern, uh, you know, a religious rule, OK? Not a pattern unless you have three examples of real stuff, OK? And, um, and, and so we actually wanted to test that. We only gave one. Now maybe if you gave three, it would be better. Um, but we actually kind of like the fact that we get some, um, you know, the, the significant benefit does come from that list of responsibilities. So yeah. there's, there's an in-between study that, that could be wrong, which would be interesting, which is in between giving the responsibilities and doing 
So if you, if for example, if you asked an alum of an HCI program, mm -hmm. uh, design me an interface to do X, I bet that a, a non-zero portion of them would drop some important aspect of user-centered design, and the thing would end up less good for that. Mm -hmm. um, now you could do what this study in essence did is said for this thing consider these specific twelve tenets of of you know your analog mm -hmm. user-centered design. You could do the in-between thing. Um, which is simply say, you could prime them and say, uh, before you design this, write down the set of responsibilities that you think this thing should have. So where the subjects would generate that responsibility set themselves. That's kind of the well, they did that. They, they did that in the, I mean, that's what the first condition had to do. First condition said, you know, consider cancel, adding cancel to this. And they were asked, to modify the UML, but to write down the responsibilities. They had to write down what's, and that was one of the things we took the union up. So they had an explicit list of the responsibilities they were going to implement, and then they would put them in the design, okay, in, in the diagrams. If they put something in the diagram that didn't show up in the list of responsibilities, we gave them credit for it anyway, okay, because of this issue of, you know, People are not 100% consistent in making them, you know, like uh, every diagram agree with every other diagram. Um, so, so in essence, that we that's what we did in that in that lowest condition, and they did very poorly, even though they took hours. I mean, the the, the time was several hours, and we never stopped them. We let them just finally say they were they were done. So essentially, that's what we did, and, and we got very very surprisingly bad results. I really expected them to to do a lot more. We really did. Yeah. I know you were looking at just software, but it seems that this would generalize well to even designing devices or processes. Do you think that that's true? Um, probably. I mean, there's probably things like if you're going to do handhelds, it better be the right size for somebody's hand. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I mean, is that the sort of of thing you're, you know, it has to be a certain, you know, weight that's within, uh, you know, a certain ab ability of, of, you know, so there's kind of, there's kind of patterns of, you know, all laptops are about the same size and weight, all handhelds are about the same size and weight because they're joining between the human capabilities, what they can carry, what they can hold in their hand, what they can stick in their pocket, um, and that's kind of a pattern. Is, is that what you're thinking of, or? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's. I can't think of the notion of patterns being used for designing hardware that I know of. I mean, have you seen that b before? Oh, well, as a mechanical engineer, there are whole handbooks of how to do gears and, and turbines and, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. That was handbooks and handbooks and handbooks of patterns. They're not, they're not patterns in the religious sense, but they were examples of how, you know, yeah, it's all over the place. Well, I think there's a long tradition of, of encapsulating best practice in a form that current designers can use. Whether you give it the name pattern or not, um, it, you know, is pattern is you know, a, a newer thing. I mean, certainly it comes, it comes from building architecture, you know, designing buildings. So I think it, it's quite broad. And I think there's what patterns of museum development. Anyway, yeah, I think I think it's a broad, I think it's a very broad notion. Yep. Um, do you have any data like showing if the benefit changes depending on how specific the requirements are? Like right now it's cancellation, but with mm -hmm. with cancellation plus some specific condition, would it be more helpful? Yeah. So it would be wonderful to be able to really analyze the trade offs between different quality attributes. Um, and uh, see how people can balance all the different things they have to do. I mean, that's what design is about, right? You've got so many different things you want to, to make great, just so many resources, and a lot of these conflict with each other. Um, so that's kind of a more general question. How do you do trade-offs between this and other issues that you're trying to optimize? Um, and we, we don't have, we haven't made it there yet. We're trying to do the usability at all first before we can do that. Though that's always the question, because that's what people have to do when they really design. There's, that's a general question in software engineering. 
trying to think about the difference between web applications versus desktop applications. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and from, <coughs> excuse me, from one perspective, the answer might be no, none. Yeah. But from another, it gets into the context of distributed systems, yeah. either distributed application side or distributed UI side. Mm -hmm. And uh, that struck me as a fairly interesting question in terms of what you're doing, is mm -hmm. whether, whether there seem to be differences feeding into distributed systems uh, architecture versus standalone. Yeah, um, I don't know. Again, there's this, this work has opened up so many questions in so many places, and we, uh, you know, help. <laughs> Hang on. Okay, as I said, the okay, round, thank you. So come see her. Thank you. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.